I'd like to talk to you today about the industrial uses of yeast, with particular emphasis on brewing and distilling yeasts. Yeast, including the genus Saccharomyces cerevisiae, are unicellular fungi. Interest in this diffuse grouping of, of fungi can be divided into three areas. First of all, it's an experimental eukaryote. It has very similar structure to mammals, including humans, and therefore it has been used in the laboratory as an experimental microorganism for many, many decades. A few yeast genera, not Saccharomyces, contain species that are animal, includes humans, pathogens, and cause disease. Yeast, particularly Saccharomyces, has significant industrial economic value, and in this area I will focus on during my talk. There are a number of areas for in the industrial uses of yeast. First of all, and most importantly, are potable ethanol. Beer, cider, wine, spirits, such as whiskey, gin, vodka, rum, liqueurs, and a number of others. Industrial ethanol, particularly these days, fuel ethanol, pharmaceuticals, sterilants, and solvents. Baker's yeast, which includes biomass, animal feeds, and natural carbon dioxide. Yeast extracts, cell walls, membranes, mannans, glucans, vitamins, fluid flavorings. Yeast extracts are used extensively in foods, particularly soups. They're also, yeast extracts are also used by many people on, as, as on their toast or for, uh, during their breakfast. And this includes things like Marmite and Vegemite. Heterologous proteins and peptides. These are proteins and peptides that are, that are produced as a result of genetic manipulation. Insulin interferon are in this category. And it's a plethora of medical applications that I will not consider further today. I'd like to focus now on brewing and distilling whiskey yeasts. That single cell of yeast of Saccharomyces with multiple bud scars. Yeast of that nature would have one mother scar and a number of bud scars. And I think that electron microscope shows the bud scars very well. The structure, intercellular structure of yeast it's very similar to that of mammals. It has a number of organelles. Nu the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum for protein synthesis, the, vac the, va the vacuole, the vacuole for the storage of a variety of enzymes, and the mitochondrion, which is used for the production of energy. And I'll say more about them in a minute. Saccharomyces consists of seven genera. At least that's the current state of play. There's been a considerable controversy about yeast taxonomy over the years, but today I think we can safely say, for the foreseeable future, we're all agreed that it's now seven genera, the most important of which is Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Saccharomyces pastorianus. Saccharomyces cerevisiae includes baker's yeast, a yeast, distillers yeast, and a variety of other yeast. And Saccharomyces pastorianus is the lager yeast. And it's very important, of course, because lager is the most important beer in, terms, in volume terms produced on this planet. Saccharomyces pastorianus and Saccharomyces cerevisiae are related. They, they have what we call 50% gene homology. That's not a great relationship. They are, if you like, distant cousins. It's worth remember that, that we, Homo sapiens, have 98% homology to a variety of monkeys. So they're not that related. The traditional difference between ale and lager strains are ale yeast contains is, is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the ale type, as I've said. It has a fermentation temperature of 18 to 20 degrees centigrade. Maximum growth temperature is 37 degrees centigrade. And it's what we call a top fermenter. That means at the end of fermentation, the yeast rises to the surface of the fermentation, adsorbed 
this copper dioxide bubbles and this top crop is skimmed and he reused in a subsequent fermentation. Lachis, as I said, the most important tax, taxonomic uh, nomenclature these days is Saccharomyces pastorialis. At a fermentation temperature of 18 to 15 degrees centigrade, a maximum growth temperature, somewhat less than Saccharomyces cerevisiae, of 34 degrees centigrade, it ferments the disaccharide melabios which is a disaccharide consisting of glucose and galactose. Aries cannot metabolize these melabios because they don't contain the male genes which are important for producing the important enzyme uh, alpha galactosidase which is used for the hydrolysis of melabios into glucose and galactose and then subsequent fermentation by yeast. And it, large yeasts are bottom fermenters. At the end of fermentation Invariably, not always, but invariably, the yeast descends to the bottom of the fermenter as flux, which we'll talk about a bit later in this talk. And these, these, this, this yeast at the bottom of the fermenter is, is, is cropped and reused in, in the subsequent fermentation. The objectives of Brewer's word uh, fermentation and the Stiller's word fermentations are to consistently metabolize word constituents into ethanol carbon dioxide and other fermentation metabolites in order to produce potable products with satisfactory quality and stability. In addition, brewers yeast should produce yeast crops that can be confidently repitched, inoculated into subsequent brews. A distiller's yeast is only used once. Distiller's yeast is not recycled. That's an important difference between distillers and brewers yeast. What is wood? Well, it's a complex aqueous solution of cereal grain extract, barley, and adjuncts. Adjuncts are unmalted cereals in variety, such as corn, wheat, and rice. And it's intended for fermentation by yeast into beer or an undistilled spirit. Wood is created by mashing, and then the spent grains from this, this mashing process are usually separated from the sweet unhopped wood with a lot of ton, which essentially is a joint size uh, fil filter, filter funnel or a, or, a, or a large mash filter, which again is a form of filter. Wood contains the simple sugars, sucrose, fructose, glucose, maltose, which is a disaccharide, and maltotriose, which is a trisaccharide. Dextrins, amino acids, peptides, proteins, vitamins, iron, nucleic acids, and numerous other constituents. The brewing process is a unit process, invariably these days batch. Continuous brewing was experimented upon for many years, but it's not used very much these days. Predominantly, the brewing process is a batch process, consisting of a number of units which, which start with malt or an adjunct, go through the, 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 the kettle boiling stage, the, the wood is, is, is then fermented and it is matured. There are differences between brewing and dist the distilling process. The wood, or wash as some distillers call it, production is similar, but there are a few differences. In distilling, the wood is not boiled or hopped. Consequently, it's not sterile and contains amylase and proteinase activity. As brewer's wood is boiled, it is sterile and does not contain enzyme activity. Unlike brewing, the fermentation temperature, in the fermentation temperature in distilling is not rigorously controlled and the yeast culture is not recycled. Fermented distilling wood is distilled. Wood metabolism, well, one of the the major advances in brewing science during the past 40 years or so has been the elucidation of the mechanisms by the yeast cell utilizes in an orderly manner the plethora of wood nutrients that I've already discussed with you. The order of wood sugars by a typical brewing yeast strain is very much in a, in, in a set, set order or sequence. The glucose and fructose 
which are the green and the white line are taken up first. Once about 60% of the sugars is taken up by the yeast, the uptake of maltose and maltotriose begins, that's the red and the blue line, and, and the dextrins, which is the maltotetros and the larger sugars, are not taken up at all, and they go through into the, to the final product. Distiller's wort is not boiled, as we've already said. As a consequence, contains active amylases and proteases. Therefore, during the fermentation process, active hydrolysis of these wood sugars continues, and therefore the uptake of the glucose, maltose, maltotriose, and dextrins, because of active amylase in the wood, it continues, and it's a very, very mixed process. Not in, not in the ordered sequence you get with brewer's wood. And if we look at the next slide, you'll see the uptake of distiller's wood on the left, and the uptake of brewer's wood on the right. And as you can see again, the brewer's wood uptake is very ordered, while the, the uptake of sugars by in distiller's wood is, is, is somewhat haphazard. The uptake of sugars by yeast has been studied by many people, and the uptake of glucose and fructose are taken up by the yeast in a passive or a facilitated transport process. It doesn't require the expenditure of energy. Whereas the uptake of maltose and maltotriose is taken up by yeast by virtue of an active transport process, requires the expenditure of ATP. And once the maltose and the maltotriose are inside the cell, the alpha glucosidase enzyme metabolizes the, uh, the, 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 the two sugars to glucose, and the glucose enters the common metabolic glycolytic pathway of the yeast. Yeast contains 20 amino acids, and they are taken up by the yeast also in, in an orderly manner, whereby group A is absorbed uh, rapidly early in the fermentation, group P B is, uh, is absorbed slowly at the start of fermentation, group C is absorbed slowly later in the fermentation, and group D, little or no absorption, takes place during fermentation. And the only amino acid in group D is proline, and this goes through into the final beer. This work, in terms of elucidating the order of amino acids, was originally conducted in the Guinness Laboratory in London, England, by Margaret Jones and John Pierce in the 1960s. This work certainly stood the test of time. We looked again at the order of uptake using modern HPLC electrical equipment, and the only change that we would recommend is moving methionine, the sulfur containing amino acid, from group B into group A. Otherwise, we would totally agree with the sequence as you see on that slide. Now, mitochondria, I've already referred to. A mitochondrion, which is plural, which is mitochondria, is a membrane-enclosed organelle in, in, in eukaryote cells, including yeast. Mitochondria generate most of the cell's energy and are therefore described as cellular power plants. Mitochondria are also involved in, the cells, in cell cycle and growth. And mitochondria are recognized in electron micrographs as aerobically grown cells as spheroidal, rod shaped, sausage shaped structures with a double membrane. The double membrane, as you can see on the, the diagram on, on the left, is a double membrane, and inside the yeast there are a number of other membranes called Christi. It's on these Christi that all the reactions occur. For example, the uh, reactions of the trichosilic acid cycle. And on the, on, on, on the right, on your right B, you, you can see the, an electron micrograph of, of a mitochondria, and you can see all the intercellular membranes. Mutation in yeast can occur in a number of cases. This is spontaneous mutations. And this can occur most frequently in the mitochondria. This is the called a respiratory deficient or a petite mutation. I'll discuss why it's called petite in a minute. 
The unmutated culture is respiratory sufficient, that's the wild type. Yeast mitochondria contain their own DNA, and this is termed mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is about 2% of the total DNA within the yeast. The other 90% is in the nucleus. The, the RD mutation occurs at, at frequency between 0.5 and 5%. Stress conditions, certification, Osmotic pressure, temperature, for example, can induce RD formation. And I'll say something about certification and temperature in a minute. RD mutants exhibit alterations in sugar uptake, overall metabolism, flocculation, and reduced stress tolerance. One way of identifying respiratory deficient cells or colonies is to use this triphenyl tetrodotoncloy overlay method. You can overlay a yeast plate containing a number of single colonies of yeast with triphenyltetrazone chloride absor dissolved in agar. Under those circumstances, the respiratory sufficient, the wild type, will stain pink or red, whereas the respiratory deficient colonies will stain will be will stay white. And as you can see. The reason why the RD colonies are so much smaller, and that's why they're called petites. Respiratory sufficient yeast will be able to are able to metabolize glucose and other sugars, and also substrates which are uh, which are not fermentable but are involved in respiration. Lactate is an example of, of such a material. Respiratory sufficient, the wild type again, can metabolize both glucose and lactate. As I've said, respiratory deficient can only metabolize glucose. They cannot metabolize, metabolize lactate and other, other substrates of nature because they don't have an actively function TCA cycle. Some work that we conducted a number of years ago in a brewery in Canada was to look at the effects of certification at different temperatures, exit temperatures, on the formation of respiratory deficiency and yeast viability. So the freshly propagated culture had about 1% RD and a viability of 98%. When that culture was centrifuged with a 30 degree centigrade exit temperature for 10 cycles, the percentage RD went up to 28% and the viability was 72%. When the certification exit temperature was reduced to 20 degrees centigrade, the RD level decreased to 8% 8, 8 and the viability increased 84%. So you can see the stress effects, particularly the synergy between temperature and certification, had a serious effect upon the yeast and its ability, and, and it, 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 it formed and it resulted in the formation of respiratory deficient cells. If you take those respiratory sufficient and the respiratory deficient cultures from the, the same strain, you will see and, and conduct a static fermentation in wood, the yeast in suspension with the RD, with the RS, that's the red line, is significantly greater, more biomass and more yeast in suspension than the RD yeast, which, which really has, has less biomass and less yeast in suspension. This, of course, results in differences in fermentation rate in the same wood. So the respiratory sufficient yeast fermented faster than the respiratory deficient yeast. The reason for that was that the uptake of the, the maltose and the glucose was slower in the respiratory deficient yeast compared to the respiratory deficient yeast. The uptake of glucose and fructose was not really altered very much, but the important differences, as I say, were the uptake of the maltose and the maltotriones. The final area I'd like to talk to you about is yeast flocculation. Yeast flocculation is a non-sexual, homotypic process involving only one type of yeast cell interaction. 
talk about processes involving more than one type of microorganism in, in a minute. It requires calcium. It's reversible. The flocks can be universally dispersed by the action of the chelating agent, EDTA, which removes the calcium, or by specific sugars such as mannose, and can aggregate into multicellular masses composed of thousands of cells called flocks. And that's a typical alias flock. Yes, flocculation studies are important to brewing because the process requires yeast cropping for culture reuse. It is also used as a model experimental experimental system to study cell-cell interaction. And cell-cell interaction is important in microorganisms, it's important in mammalian systems and plant systems. Formation of yeast flocks is dependent on both genetic and environmental parameters, and I'll talk about genetic parameters in a minute. Flocculation is a cell surface characteristic, as you would expect. Lectin-like proteins interact with carbohydrate residues of alpha mannan receptors of neighboring cells to, to give you a structure which the yeast, yeast form flocks. And the presence of calcium ions is essential to enable the lectin to achieve an active conformation. Genetic control of yeast has been studied for many years. We began research in this area with my colleague Inga Russell in our days with the Bats in Canada, where we looked at flow one. And we characterized the flow one gene. And we showed that it is it, it mapped it onto chromosome one that are sixteen chromosomes in in Saccharomyces, mapped it onto chromosome 1 on the right-hand side of the centromere. And at that point, this is, say, is the uh, late 70s, early 80s, we thought that we had really come to an end of research on flocculation. Not so. Since that time, a number of flocculation genes have been identified by uh, quite a large number of diff different scientists. And these days, flow 11 is receiving considerable attention. There are two other types of yeast flocculation. There are other types of yeast flocculation. There's co-flocculation between two different yeast strains, and acidic peptides are important in the medium for this to occur. And this only occurs in ale yeast, as I say, and the acidic peptides are peptides that contain significant proportions of the acidic amino acids, aspartic and glutamic acid. It also is, is calcium induced. And the other type of yeast flocculation involves bacteria, where bacteria induced yeast flocculation, and it's independent of calcium. First of all, let's talk about co-flocculation between two yeast strains. First of all, co-flocculation has only been shown by us anyway uh, in ale yeast. We cannot, we've never been able to show, co uh, to illustrate co-flocculation in lung yeast strains. Here we have two separate yeast strains, A and B. On their own, these two strains of A yeast are non-flocculant. And this shows them fermenting in two litre measuring cylinders. And at the end of fermentation in wood, the yeast is still in, in suspension. If you mix the two together at the start, at inoculation, at the end of fermentation, a lot of the yeast has sedimented out of the fermenter, and a lot of it actually come out of the fermenter as well. And, and, and most of the yeast is no longer, no longer in suspension. And a vitro test, called the Helm sedimentation test, confirms these results. This is the test conducted in Centrifuge in, 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 a, in a measuring cylinder or in one of the test tubes. Here it's in 100 milliliter measuring cylinder. Where the two strains A and B do not sediment out of suspension on their own, but put the two together after about 10 minutes, and you can see that the yeast has sedimented out of suspension. Bacterial juice flocculation is very different, except that it's, a, it's another form of flocculation. So people working in Brazil in a fuel alcohol plant isolated from that plant a strain of Lactobacillus, a rod 
showed lactobacillus, which induced flocculation in ale type yeast. And if this, this, this yeast was present in the yeast in the yeast in the yeast culture, it would induce the induce the yeast to form flocks and sediment out of the fermenter. If the bacteria was not present, the fermenting yeast, or the yeast conducting the fermentation, remained as single cells. Now, in conclusion, I'd like to bring to your notice some publications that you may find of interest. Two years ago, the Institute of Brewing and Distilling celebrated its 125th anniversary. And one of the things that it did to, as part of this celebration was to publish a number of reviews in Brewing and Distilling in the Journal of the Institute of Brewing. And this is the review that Inga Russell, Annie Hill and I published. Also, two years ago, in Portland, Oregon, the American Academy of Microbiology conducted a workshop on brewer's yeast and out of this workshop came the booklet on your right hand side. If any of you, any of you would like a copy of both or, or, or one of these publications, please contact me and I'll make sure that you receive them. So in summary, yeast is a large grouping of unicellular fungi that have many industrial uses. Ethanol production is the most important economic use, with potable ethanol being preeminent. Brewing and distilling whiskey yeast possess many features and characteristics in common, but are, there are also differences. For example, in brewing, a yeast culture is recycled or repritched through a number of fermentations, whereas a distiller's yeast culture is only used just once. In pro important properties of both yeast types, brewing and distilling, are overall wood fermentation rate, Sugar and amino acid uptake efficiency, stress tolerance, genetic stability, and appropriate flocculation characteristics. As I say, a lot of people have contributed to the research that I've described in this paper, for which I'd like to acknowledge. And the invaluable assistance and support of Anne Anstruther, my secretary, in developing this presentation is gratefully acknowledged. Thank you very much.